Well, once again, greetings and welcome to another edition of our online adult Bible study, Scripture Night in America. I'm Pastor Steve Wagner coming to you live from Trinity Lutheran Church in Lombard, Illinois. And it is my pleasure to be with you this evening. If you are watching this on December 27th, 2000 and, or 2023, then you are watching us live. So we're doing uh, new stuff tonight. So today we are looking at the, old, the gospel lesson and the Old Testament lesson from this coming Sunday. This coming Sunday is going to be the first Sunday of after Christmas, the first Sunday of the Christmas season. Christmas isn't just a day in the church calendar, it's also a season. So let's take a look at our Christmas-themed uh, our Christmas-themed theme, and it doesn't get any more Christmas than this. Jesus has come in the flesh to save the world. Jesus has come in the flesh to save the world. All right, so our Old Testament lesson comes to us from Isaiah 61.10 through Isaiah 62.3, and our gospel lesson comes to us from Luke chapter 2. So why don't we go ahead and post Isaiah 61.62 up and get started. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to be sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as a brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. All right, so what did you just hear? All right, well, what you, this is Isaiah and Anytime you hear Isaiah, and you hear Isaiah a lot in our lectionary, with good reason, um, Isaiah is written to God's people during a very difficult time. He is uh, prophesying that they're about to be hauled off captive into Babylon for 70 years, and they're going to need to um, they're going to they're going to need God's reassurance and saving. And the Babylonian captivity of the Israelites, similar to their captive in Egypt back in Exodus, should be seen as representative of our captivity by sin, of which we can't escape. Only God can set us free, just like only God could have set the people free here. So when the people got taken captive, they're probably sitting there wondering, oh gosh, uh, our sin caused us to lose God. He doesn't love us anymore. Uh, we're not going to make it. Uh, God, please save us. Please save us. And so the last part of Isaiah is written to his people to reassure them that he will, in fact, do so. So what you just heard, at least the first part of it, the first couple verses of it, is earlier in Isaiah 61, before our text, God had promised, look, I'm going to save you. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to make everything right again. Don't worry. It's going to be all good. And so the first couple of verses here are the people's reaction uh, to hearing this good news. They are very excited. They're thankful. So in reaction to hearing that they're, they will be saved, they, the people say, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. And of course, the idea here is that us being saved from our sin in the same way they were saved from their captivity should also cause us to rejoice knowing that God has rescued us from our sin. 
so they're expressing the joy at the promises that were just made to them in light of them being in the Babylonian captivity. So they say they're going to rejoice in the Lord because he has clothed me Um, a lot of times us being saved is reflective of the Bible talking about us being clothed in or wrapped up, covered up in God's righteousness. God's righteousness just smears us. If you've watched on Sunday morning when I lead worship, I wear a white, uh, alb. It's, it's a, a covering of sorts and that symbolizes the whiteness of over me symbolizes how God has covered me with his holiness and he's done the same thing for you as well now it talked about how they will it will be um, we will look as as a bridegroom looks when they're decked out with a beautiful headdress and a bride adorns herself with jewels So salvation sometimes also is is discussed as lavish garments, fancy garments. Um, obviously, you know, precious jewels and gorgeous headdresses, uh, that would catch the eye. They are things of great value. Um, that sort of captures... What When God pulled us out of the wreckage of sin, that gives an idea of what he has turned us into. Uh, something really great and joyous and of great value like that. Then it talked about the earth shall bring forth sprouts, garden causes the sown, what is sown to sprout up. So the earth sprouting. You know, you plant a seed in the earth, if you're a farmer or whatever, a gardener, you plant a seed in the earth and something grows. Um, so just as the earth is certain to cause, at least if it's planted in good soil, is certain to cause a sown seed to sprout, God is just as certain to give salvation for us through the coming Jesus. So this is talking about you know, this joy expressed here is, you know, we just went through Advent where we were joyful anticipation. We're waiting. Oh, we can't wait. Hurry up. Get here, Jesus. Well, then when he gets here, now we're excited that he's here. So this captures that excitement of Christmas that God has come. And we're talking now about why he came, which is to save us from our sin. Now, at this point, the narrative switches back to, this is now, this point forward is going to be God talking. Previously, the first couple of verses were God's people talking in response to being saved. Now we're going back to hearing God's words. God says, for Zion and Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep silent. And with good reason. Um, so going all the way back to creation, God's word gives life. God's word gives life. And in fact, God's word is the only thing that gives life in actuality. So as long as God speaks his word, life is going to be given. People will be saved. But if God closes his mouth, life is not going to be available so it's God's will that he would not keep silent because the more God speaks the more people are saved now when it says for Zion and Jerusalem's sake I, this I don't know if this needs to be said or not but I'm going to say it anyways uh, God said he will not keep quiet for the sake of Zion and Jerusalem the question is who is Zion and Jerusalem some people take this to understand that Zion and Jerusalem are 
earthly countries, in other words, the nation of Israel, the political nation of Israel. But in actuality, this Zion in Jerusalem that God is saying he will not keep quiet for the sake of is not an earthly kingdom or setup. It is his church, his kingdom, his collection of believers, because God is not about setting up an earthly country and making it very, very, um, very, very wealthy and taken care of, but rather God is about opening the kingdom of heaven. Jesus came to get people into heaven, not to make people rich or comfortable. So Zion and Jerusalem is about heaven, not about earthly lands. Now he says for Zion and Jerusalem's sake, the church's sake, he's not going to keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. Now this is the imagery that is all over the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John, the idea that Jesus is the light of the world. So, so often in the Bible, Jesus, the Savior, is depicted as light. Uh, sin is depicted as darkness. Um, and there's actually a lot of truth to that, obviously. And so we know how light eradicates darkness. If there is light, darkness cannot be. The lights are on in this room right now. Therefore, there cannot be darkness. Darkness and light cannot coexist together, just like Jesus and sin can't coexist together. So um, brightness and light overcoming darkness that's the imagery here we're talking about because by virtue of God not being silent, his word, Jesus personified, is going to go out and conquer darkness with brightness. And, you know, the, another bit of imagery that's helpful to look at here is the fact that if you see um, brightness in torches, that calls attention to it. And so, again, this is what God wants. He wants his word to be heard. He wants his word to have attention given to it because his word saves, his word gives light. Again, Jesus came to save. Then it says that the nations shall see your righteousness. The nations shall see. So when God pulls the Israelites out of Babylonian captivity, that's going to make big news worldwide. Everybody's going to see it. Everybody's going to understand that that was done by the hand of God. Well, again, God pulling his people out of Babylonian captivity foreshadows his pulling his people out of the spiritual captivity of sin. And God wants everybody to see it. Because, once again, God wants everyone to be saved. Not everyone will be saved, but it is God's will that everyone would be saved, and for everyone to be saved, he should not keep silent so his word can create brightness where there is darkness of sin. So he wants all the nations to see this. He's going to make a big show, a big spectacle out of it. And he says, as a result of all of this, you shall be called by a new name. Now, anytime you read scripture and you talk about God, you hear about God talking about a new name, it ought to ring a bell, it ought to raise an eyebrow. Um, because when God gives somebody a new name, it's not like, oh, I used to go by Joe, but now I'm going by Bill. But rather, in biblical thought, one's name is more than just a means of identification, telling one person apart from the other. In the Bible, a person's name is an extension of their identity, an extension of their humanity. It defines them. It's who they are as a person. If uh, you remember from your catechism days, when you studied the Ten Commandments, the second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, or you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, however you learned it. Um, 
Americans in the 21st century culture don't may not understand what's the big deal about misusing God's name. Well, the problem with it is if you come at it from the biblical understanding of a name, uh, God's name is an extension of who he is. God's name has his power. God's name has his holiness. It's not just a name. It, it, it is who it is him. So if you think of it that way, you can understand why it wouldn't be right to use it in unholy ways. Well, not only does God's name in biblical thought, not only does God's name, uh, is that an extension of him, your name also is an extension of you. So anytime you hear of a name change in the Bible, um, God giving someone a new name, they're giving someone a new identity, they're giving someone a new standing before him, uh, the idea being that our original identity, our name, was sinner bound for eternal death but if god gives you a new name he's given you new identity which the new identity we have by virtue of baptism is heaven bound saint so when god's giving somebody a new name uh he's talking about your identity being changed your eternal destiny being changed you're getting a new standing before god through forgiveness and then it closes by God talking about his church being a crown of beauty in the hand of God. Now, God's hand is always going to give his protection because of his, the power that is in his hand. Um, but the crown of beauty, again, we talked how earlier about how, uh, when we go from being defined by sin to defined by God's forgiveness and, and having his righteousness, that makes us beautiful. It makes us beautiful in the eyes of God. So we will be like this big fancy crown of beauty that he can't wait to show off. And it being in his hand means it's going to be under his protection and governance. Okay, so Isaiah 61, 62, that you will hear this coming Sunday, talks about, you know, in, in the Easter context, it talks about how since Jesus has now come in the flesh, uh, we're really excited, we're really happy, he's going to do great things for us. And God responds to that by saying, you know what, the party's just getting started, I'm not going to keep silent. My word is going to go out creating brightness in the darkness of sins. Everybody's going to know it. It's going to change your identity and standing, and you're going to be really beautiful. It's actually a beautiful uh, message if you think about it. So Jesus coming at Easter causes all this to happen, and that's the greater point. Okay, so that gets us through our Old Testament lesson. And let's take a look at our gospel lesson from Luke 2. The gospel lesson this Sunday is from 22 through 40. But we're going to split it up into two parts. We'll first look at Luke 2, 22 through 32, and then we'll finish with 33 through 40. So let's put Luke 22, or Luke 2, 22 through 32 up on the screen and take a look at it. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens up the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came into the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, 
Simeon took Jesus up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Okay. That might sound familiar to you for more reasons than one, which we'll talk about here in a second. Now, the text starts out, says, talking about the time of their purification according to the law of Moses. All right. So, according to Leviticus 12, Again, this is Old Testament ceremonial law. And while a lot of this might not be familiar to you, that's for good reason because uh, since Jesus fulfilled Old Testament ceremonial law, it's no longer necessary for us to do all of that Old Testament uh, sacrificial purification stuff. But at the time this was going on, that was still very much in effect. So... Leviticus 12, verses 3 through 4 said that when a baby male was born, uh, they had to be circumcised on the eighth day, and there had to be a purification ritual done on the 40th day. Now, the thing that's kind of cool about all of this as a little bit of an aside um, is that Jesus was able to be our atoning sin sacrifice because the whole point of it was that we're not perfect, we can't keep God's law. Well, he was perfect. So he was because he was perfect and holy, the he's the only person that had no punishment coming for sin because he wasn't of sin. Well, Jesus said to the Father, "Okay, I don't have any sin coming because I was perfect and holy, but I'll tell you what, instead of punishing everybody else for their sin, give everybody else's punishment for their sin to me so that they would not be punished. Well, in order to qualify to be the sacrificial sin savior, he had to be perfect and holy. Um, that meant that every little Levitical law Every little Old Testament law, every little law in the Gospels, Jesus had to keep fully. So, <clears throat> I don't know if we're froze or not. Hopefully we're not. I... All right, it looks like we're back. Uh, so, the point is that Jesus had to keep every single uh, Old Testament law down to the letter Otherwise, he wouldn't qualify for being our sin sacrifice because he would have his own sins that he had to atone for. So even the law of purification, Jesus was keeping. Even as, oh, thanks, Annette, I appreciate it. I didn't know if I froze or not. It froze on my end. Thank you. Um, so even though Jesus was a newborn baby, all of God's law was kept in him, even as a child. Okay. So the time came for the purification according to the law where he had to be presented to the Lord. Now that comes from Exodus 13. Because Exodus 13, I believe it was verse 2, said that the firstborn male of a woman should be dedicated to the Lord because they would be considered holy to the Lord. In the Old Testament days, firstborn males had a position of privilege. Well, Jesus was the firstborn male to marry, so not only did he need to be purified on the appropriate day, he had to be presented to the Lord accordingly, again, Jesus is keeping all of the law, which is what made him uh, able to be our substitute in the first place. Now, as part of this, um, 
as part of this purification ritual, sacrifices had to be offered, which should be no surprise because throughout the Old Test, the entire Old Testament, the atonement for sin and the forgiveness of sin came through uh, the sacrifices, which those animal sacrifices pointed to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, which would be the final necessary sacrifice once and for all. Um, again, we're talking Leviticus 12, Leviticus 12, verses 6 through 7, called for a burnt offering and a sin offering as part of this purification ritual. Now, the text said that Mary and Joseph brought in a pair of turtle doves or pigeons. If you read Leviticus 12, Leviticus 12 said that a dove or pigeon would be sufficient for the um, sin offering, but the burnt offering had to be a lamb unless the person making the offering was financially poor. And if they were financially poor, then a dove or pigeon could be substituted for the lamb uh, in that case, while well, we know Mary and Joseph were very poor, so instead of bringing a lamb and a dove, they brought two doves, uh, which Levitical law allowed for since they were in poverty. Now we're introduced to a man named Simeon. Simeon... This is the only time in Scripture that this man is mentioned. This is the only time we know him, but it is kind of a pivotal moment. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Simeon, but what we are told is he was righteous and devout. Um, that is the way that the Bible typically describes a believer. You have heard Scripture talk about people who are righteous. Well, we know the Bible also says that every person except for Jesus, outside of Jesus, no person is righteous in and of themselves. So when a person is righteous, the Bible calls them righteous. They're not calling them righteous because they're perfect people. Uh, the people who the Old Testament, a short list of people who the Old Testament is called righteous would include Abel from Cain and Abel, Noah, Abraham, David, among others. Uh, all, of, all four of those at least were called righteous, but it's not because they were sinless. It's because God gave them his righteousness. We talked a little bit ago about being clothed with uh, the robe of righteousness. Um, so this guy, Simeon, is not righteous on his own, but he has been clothed in righteous, i.e. he is a believer. He's a child of God. Because the fact is, you also are righteous in the eyes of God, not as am I. Not because we're holy and perfect, but because we're forgiven. Um, Lori says Simeon was really aware that he was in the presence of God we should all be so blessed by the Holy Spirit I'm actually going to bring that up it's, it's, it's funny you say that and I think when I bring it up many of you who have been Lutherans for a long time and engaged in liturgical worship for a long time are going to know what I'm talking about um, now it said righteous and devout. Well, being devout is a person who rigorously makes it a priority to try to keep as much of God's law and to live the way God wants as they possibly can, which is the natural reaction that one will have of the Holy Spirit creating repentance and faith in their heart. So Simeon is a spiritually healthy believer. Now, it says that he was waiting for the consolation 
of Israel. Waiting on the consolation of Israel. The Greek word there for consolation can also be translated as comfort. So he's waiting on the comfort of Israel. He's waiting for Israel to be comforted. Now that might ring a bell because a little earlier in Advent, there was that passage from Isaiah 40 when talking to God's people who have been ravaged by captivity God tells Isaiah to comfort, comfort my people, and they are comforted by the promise of salvation. Well, so that is to say that if Simeon is waiting on the consolation or the comfort of Israel, he's waiting on the Savior because that's how salvation comes. Um, that word choice was rather intriguing. Now it says that the Holy Spirit was on upon was upon him. Uh, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and in the era of the Gospels equipped somebody to make a godly declaration through divine revelation through the Holy Spirit. So Simeon's about well, you heard what Simeon said. Uh, that was the Holy Spirit inspiring him to say it. And he, Simeon had. This is kind of cool. Simeon had been told by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he would see the Lord's Christ. So people had been waiting for literally thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years for the promised Savior. The Savior was promised all the way back in Genesis 3, and they had been waiting for generations. But Simeon was told, hey, the Savior's coming in your lifetime, and you're going to see him with your own eyes. Well, that's a great source of comfort there. Now, the text says that he came in the Spirit into the temple. Well, God clearly, by his divine providence, God arranged this entire uh, meeting. Uh, it would give God a chance to keep his promises made to Simeon as well as Give Simeon a chance to declare what God wanted the people to hear. And so the Holy Spirit said, hey, Simeon, go to the temple. Something's about to happen. You need to go. So God steered him into the temple. And then you heard what Simeon said. Now you are letting your servant depart in peace. Um, he's like, well... I'm now seeing God like you promised I would. So uh, I guess I can die in peace now whenever that day will come because you've kept your word to me. You now will let your servant, now your servant can depart in peace for mine eyes have seen your salvation. He's holding the baby Jesus in his arms as he says this. So as he's holding Jesus, he is literally looking at God's mode of salvation. So his eyes have seen God's salvation. Now, Lori said a minute ago that um, we should all be so blessed by the Holy Spirit to understand we're in the presence of God. Well, if what Simeon said rings a bell with you, uh, my, uh, you are letting your servant depart in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation. Um, he is a light for the revelation of the Gentiles glory for your people Israel <coughs> this passage of scripture is known as Simeon's song and it is part of our liturgy um, I think it's divine service setting one no excuse me divine service setting three I think uh, where it's one of the divine services it's either one three or four I'm pretty sure it's three where after we receive communion, we sing, Lord, now let us, thou your servant, depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy glory. We say, Simeon, we sing Simeon's song. Because, just like Simeon was literally holding God in his hands as a baby, you also received God physically, his actual, real body and blood in with and under the bread and wine as lutherans we confess that 
the Holy, Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, is not a symbolic ritual, but there is the real presence of Jesus in, with, and under the elements of bread and wine given for the forgiveness of sins. So we sing Simeon's song after receiving communion because we can say exactly the same thing Simeon said because just like Simeon, we were in the real physical presence of God by virtue of being in communion. So thank you, Lori, for pointing that, pointing that out. And so he says, my eyes have seen your salvation. Jesus will be a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. So Jesus came in the flesh to save the world, not just the Jews, not the Gentiles. But if Jesus is going to save Jews and Gentiles, that's everybody. Um, this is the idea that Jesus died for everybody is one of the predominant themes in the Gospel of Luke as opposed to the others, though the idea are, is in the others. But Luke pounds it home. Luke is written to the Gentiles. The idea that Jesus died for everyone is called universal justification. We are all justified in the eyes of God through the forgiveness of sin. Jesus gives us justification in the Father's eyes, but that justification is universal in that Jesus' death atoned for the sins of everyone, not just a certain group of people. Okay, so Jesus came in the flesh as Simeon saw him as a baby, 40 days old, and declared what he declared. Well, the text goes on, so let's take a look at 33 through 40. And Jesus' father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. As the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Okay. So, it says that Joseph and Mary marveled about what was being said about Jesus by Simeon. And, you know, if you put yourself in, Mar in Joseph and Mary's shoes, I mean, they're humans. I mean, they've had angels come up to them both and say, hey, the baby's uh, going to be the savior of the world. This is God that she's given birth to. Well, clearly that had an impact on all of them. Mary agreed to go along with this, and Joseph agreed not to divorce Mary and have her stoned to death for adultery. So they were believers and they knew that this was the baby, uh, this baby was God, but yet at the same time it's like we humans aren't fully capable of understanding everything all the time. And so hearing them say, or hearing Simeon say what he said to them probably gave them another like, dose of reality uh, another way to understand the reality that hey this kid is the savior of the world this is really really incredible now Simeon also said that the child is appointed for the rise and fall of many well the truth is that the fate of every human being lies in the hand of Jesus Humans will rise and fall in the earthly sense of 
in the sense of earthly success, earthly happiness, only through the hands of Jesus. And human beings will go to heaven or not, rise to heaven or fall from heaven based on Jesus. It is through Jesus that all of that will happen. Now, he also said that this child would be for a sign that will be opposed. Now, a lot of times in the Bible, especially in the Gospel of John, um, a sign is how the Bible describes a miracle that showed that Jesus actually was God. A miracle is a sign that he is, in fact, who he's claiming to be. Um, so a, mir a sign is a miracle that shows the divinity of Jesus, God in flesh. And, of course, as we saw throughout the Gospels, those signs, some of them were received, or they were received well by some people, and they were not received well by others. Many opposed Jesus in spite of the miracles, in spite of the signs, in spite of his divinity. Now, a little bit of a cold slap of reality says to Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul. Um, as great... As all of this is, the Savior's here rescuing, rescuing us from our sins, etc., etc. The fact is that Mary is going to have to suffer the pain of watching her child be crucified and put to death. That obviously will be very hurtful. So this is a foreshadowing, a prophecy. Um... And he says the thoughts through Jesus, the thoughts of many hearts would be revealed. You know, if a person thinks something, and you have thoughts, but you don't tell anybody, well, nobody's going to know your thoughts, right? But God knows your thoughts, so even thoughts are going to be revealed when one stands before Jesus in judgment. Can't keep anything from God. Then we're introduced to Anna the prophetess. Which is an interesting character. Maybe not so much an interesting character, but an interesting calling. Because here we have a prophetess. Um... We believe, teach, and confess in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, that pastors ought to be male, not female. Well, that's true, but there are so many roles that women played, God-pleasing ways, in the Bible. And here's one of them. Anna is a prophetess. Anna was declaring... declaring um, the promises of God telling that the Savior's coming one day. Um, so here was a prophetess. Now, if you look at Scripture, you have Anna the prophetess. Uh, late in Romans, you have Phoebe the deaconess, who provided acts of mercy, or performed acts of mercy in the name of God. Old Testament, you had Deborah the judge. So you had women playing significant roles in the ministry, but what you never had anywhere in Scripture was a priestess. A priest actually bestows the forgiveness of sins. And so in the Old Testament, that was uh, relegated to Levitical males. And in the New Testament, the 12 apostles were the original uh, pastors. The New Testament priests, if you will. All of them were male as well. So, you know, there really shouldn't be too much confusion on one hand. No, uh, the, yet the office of 
The holy ministry, the office of pastor, is reserved for male according to God's words, but at the same time, there are plenty of God-pleasing ways for women to serve in very, very prominent ways. And here's one of them. Now, it said she did not depart from the temple, but she worshipped, fasted, prayed night and day. Well, you're starting to see similarities between Anna and Simeon. How much more devout could you possibly get than night and day worship and prayer? Uh, the text had talked about how uh, she had lived her whole life uh, as a wife to the one man. He's passed on. She's now older and a widow, and she never leaves the temple because she's praying for the Savior to come. That's very devout. Well, now she also sees the Savior, the baby Jesus, and it says she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him all who are waiting. So she gives thanks because she realizes, like Simeon, that this is actually God that I'm in the presence of. This is the Savior. So Anna's preaching the exact same message Simeon preached, which, hey, Jesus is the Christ. He's, he's God. He's the one. And it says that they went home after they performed everything according to the law of the Lord. Levitical and Old Testament law was kind of complicated and, of course, the Pharisees made it more complicated. But um, they didn't leave town to go back home to tiny Nazareth until every bit of the law was kept. Again, that's Jesus being perfect and keeping God's law even as a baby so he could be sinless. He could be our sinless sin sacrifice. Now the text closes by talking about how Jesus the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. Wisdom is another buzzword because a lot of times in scripture, wisdom is used to describe the saving knowledge of Jesus as Lord. Uh, the saving, no the knowledge of God and everything that God wants us to know in order to be saved. Well, uh, you look at, at the book of Proverbs. Proverbs talks extensively about wisdom. Well, Jesus is wisdom personified. Jesus coming at Christmas meant that the Old Testament saving wisdom is now here in the flesh. So the verbiage used there... Uh, that Jesus was filled with wisdom, uh, that's intentional. And plus, if you look at Isaiah 11, it's another uh, somewhat famous Advent passage where Isaiah is talking about the Savior and how you will know the Savior when he comes. In Isaiah 11, verse 2, Isaiah prophesies that the coming Savior would be filled with wisdom from God. So, wisdom. Not just not earthly wisdom, not being smart in certain things, but knowing the things one needs to know to be saved. And then the text closes by saying that the favor of God was upon Jesus. Well, Jesus had favor with the Father by nature because he was holy. Now, you and I do not have favor with God by nature because by nature we are not holy, but we do have favor with God because we have been given Jesus' holiness and righteousness as a free gift through baptism. So, all right, so this, uh, this tells us what uh, the reaction to being saved will be and by the people and what God's going to do and how he's going to make us. And here is the ball getting rolling where Jesus actually comes. Jesus has come in the flesh to save the world. So our closing summary is thus. 
The Christmas season is celebrating the coming of God in flesh for the purpose of saving the world from its sins. In the Old Testament lesson from Isaiah 61 and 62, we are told of the joy of God's people at being saved and how God wishes to show off the beauty of his redeemed church so the world would know him and would come to him. And in the gospel lesson from Luke 2, we first get told of how God's law was fully kept by Jesus, which qualified him to be our Savior. And then Jesus was declared to be the promised saving Messiah by both Simeon and Anna. So Christmas is about God coming as a human to save us from our sins. Okay, so... Once again, this is a wrap, and I thank all of you for joining us this week. I pray that you would continue to watch us. I pray you would tell others about us, that you would uh, share our videos <coughs> to folks you think that they might be helpful to. A uh, couple of announcements uh, this coming Sunday, as usual, as always. We will be live streaming our worship service from the sanctuary at Trinity Lutheran in Lombard at 9 a.m. Central Time. Uh, for those of you who are local, uh, since next Monday is New Year's Day, there will be no Monday worship service. We will be back Mondays at 6 p.m. on Monday, January the 8th. Uh, so, with that, I thank you very much for joining. I pray God's richest blessings in Christ Jesus upon all of you, and I do look forward to seeing you very, very soon. I pray that the Lord would very richly bless your evening.